Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I hope you had a great day yesterday. Um, you know, even though, even though we get through a day and we may not have had a great day, we had a great day because God was present. God was with us. And we miss that sometimes. We sometimes get caught up um, in the distractions and the variety of things that are going on in our lives. And we just, we forget. We forget that God's with us. We forget that God's, um, that God promises us, promises us that he's with us. And uh, I got to admit, there were a couple times yesterday, I forgot. I got caught up in the distractions. I got caught up in... Uh, the frustration of the day and I lost sight of the bigger picture and the bigger picture is God's picture the bigger picture is God's story and we're invited into his story this is his story um, we're just part players man and I'm glad you're here this morning you're a significant player in the story of God but it's his story and that's what we've been walking through through Advent, we've been walking through his story, his revelation, his his showing humanity that he's still there, that he's working and moving. And, and so in this Advent season, we're waiting and we're anticipating for the coming Messiah, for the Savior of the world. And we get to remind ourselves over and over again how much God loves us, how merciful he is, how, forg how forgiving he is. And so today we're going to look at another passage of scripture that reveals that very thing. And we got to begin with prayer. We got to begin with asking God to give us insight, to give us vision into his, uh, into his word. Good morning, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to pray for us as we move into this. And again, thanks for being here. So let's pray. God of all creation, you tell us you never leave us, you never forsake us. You tell us that you are with us. You're with us to the end of the earth. And I give you praise for that. I thank you for each person that's here right now, each person that will come along later. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them uniquely. I pray that you would give them eyes to see. And I pray for all of us that that we wouldn't get caught up in the distractions. We wouldn't get caught up in, in the lies that the world tells us, the lies that Satan tells us, but we would be swept up in your story. We would be swept up in the truth of who you are. And so through the power of your Holy Spirit, who leads us in all truth, I pray that you would lead us in truth this morning in your word, your word that you spoke through Luke, and that we would see you, that we would see you clearly, that we would know you more, that we would understand you more, but we would also understand who we are. We would understand how you see us, how you look upon us. You're a great God, and we give you all praise and glory and honor, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be looking at Luke 1. You probably never thought that Luke 1 was this long because we've been in it several days. But we're going to be looking at Luke 1, and we're going to begin in verse 68. And so hear the word of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from, from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. 
because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the context of this is Zechariah. This is called by, in many translations, Zechariah's prophecy. Good morning, Terry. Um, and so Zechariah, just to remind us, Zechariah has been mute. He hasn't been able to speak throughout the entire pregnancy because he didn't believe the angel when the angel said that Elizabeth would be pregnant. I just want you, I want you to think about what it would be like to be mute for nine months. What would it be like to not be able to speak for nine months? Now, some people have to live this way their entire lives. But Zechariah had it for nine months. He had spoken previously, and for nine months, he had to be silent. What do you think about? What goes through your head? What, what, what are you processing? For Zechariah, he had encountered an angel of the Lord. He had encountered Gabriel. Can you imagine what he was processing, what he was thinking about, what he really wanted to tell Elizabeth? He couldn't take out his phone and text her. He couldn't send an email. And so he was almost left alone with his thoughts. What was he considering? I can only imagine he was considering what the angel of the Lord had told him. I can only imagine that he was considering the fact that he said the child that Elizabeth would be carrying would be filled with the Holy Spirit and would be a prophet. Good morning, Martha. I think there are times, y'all, that, that we need to shut up. There are times that we need to be quiet. There are times that we need to shut our mouths and we need to reflect and remember and process God, his presence with us, his word with us. We need to sit back and spend time with him. We need to, he is the God of all creation, yes, but he is the God who loves us. It says right here in Zechariah's prophecy, and, and Zacharias is filled, and Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesies. But when do you make space to be quiet? When do you make space to think upon the things of the Lord without all the other distractions? I, I wrestle with that. I got so many screens. I got, I got three screens in front, of, in front of me right now. So I just encourage you to make space. And thankfully, it's not by God's hand. You have a choice. But that's where Zachariah is. And this is, this is beautiful because remember, this is his son. This is the son that he's been waiting for. This is the son that they haven't had. Elizabeth was barren. And so think about, think about dads whenever their, their sons are born. They're so ecstatic about their child. They're so ecstatic about the fact that, that he's finally here, right? But where does Zechariah begin in his prophecy? He doesn't begin with the son. He begins with Jesus. He begins with God. He realizes that this is God's story. He realizes that this is God's purpose. He realizes that God is the main character in this story. And so he starts, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He begins with praising God. He wakes up and he praises God. Y'all, that, that is the beginning of our day. That is the beginning of our day. Waking up and praising God. Not waking up and going through our to-do list. Not waking up and figuring out what we need to do. Not waking up and, and making it about us and making the story about us. The story is about God. And Zechariah, at the end of nine months, is able to speak and his 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 first response to his son's birth is God. 
praising God. And he says, God, you have visited and redeemed your people. Visited the God of all creation. Not just an angel of the Lord, but God present with us. He's talking about Jesus. We see this over in the book of John. For the word came and dwelt in our midst. The very presence of God comes and dwells with us. He redeems us. He buys us back. He loves us that much. He loves creation that much. He loves you that much. And Zechariah knows that. Jesus hasn't even begun his ministry. Jesus is being born. And yet Zechariah knows that God is sending the Savior of the world. Do you have, do you have that anticipation? Do you have that, that awareness, that excitement? about Jesus coming into the world to rescue and to save. It says he has raised up a horn of salvation. It's a beautiful picture because the horns on an animal, they, they represent strength and power. And in the Holy of Holies in the temple, there were horns on each corner of the altar. And each corner of the altar represented the strength and the power of God the strength and the power of Almighty God. And then back in 2 Samuel, David David said that, that the horn of salvation is his refuge and his strength. The horn of salvation, Jesus, is our refuge and our strength. Is that... Is that where you run to? Is that where you find your strength? Do you try to find your strength in yourself? Do you try to find your strength in those around you? Or do you find your strength in your refuge? In Jesus. Yeshua. The Savior. So he goes on. And of course he says the house of the servant of David, which we've seen that repeated time and time again, because the Messiah was to come from the house of David. And he said, as he spoke of the mouth of the holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. He's saying the Savior of the world's coming so that we don't have to live any in fear anymore of our enemies. We don't have to, we don't have to be concerned about ourselves in, in 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 the state of or in the position or the relationship with other people. Because Jesus is coming to save. He's coming to rescue. He's coming to deliver. For the Israelites, that was huge. Because they were under the oppression of Rome, of the Roman government. What are you under the oppression of? What's holding you down? It may be thoughts in your head. It may be thoughts in your heart. It may be desires and passions about other things. What is holding you captive? What is holding you and oppressing you? Because Jesus came to set us free from that. He came to rescue us. He came to deliver us from our enemies. And a lot of times we think our enemies are outside, but many times our enemies are here and here in our heart. Jesus came to set you free from that. He came to deliver you from that. From the beginning of time, when Zechariah is prophesying this, but, but, I mean, at the, at the point of, of Jesus not even being born yet, the Messiah not even entering into the world, Zechariah knew that, do we? And then I love the fact that he said, it's rooted in mercy in the holy covenant of God. Zechariah is remembering what God had promised, remembering that God is faithful to his promise. Y'all, God is faithful to the promise that he makes to you and to me. He is constant. He is, he is never bending. He is never relenting for all creation, but for you. Because of his mercy, it says later on that it's out of his, his tender mercy. But he goes on and he says this covenant, this relationship that God established through Abraham, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. You see, the reason the Savior of the world is coming into the world, the reason Jesus came into the world is not just to redeem us, to buy us back, not just to rescue us, 
but to rescue us so that we might serve him. Serve him. Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And we are created in his image. We're created in the image of a servant king. Are you serving God? Are you serving God right now? How are you serving your fellow man? How are you serving the people around you? Or are you serving yourself first and foremost? Because Jesus came to rescue us so that we might serve him without fear. And he goes on, and this is how we are to serve in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And that's what God is doing through sending the Savior of the world. He's bringing us back into holiness, his holiness, his righteousness. It's not the righteousness and holiness of man. It's the righteousness and holiness of God. It's not what you think or what I think is right. It's what the word of God says is right. And this is where our world is really missing it right now. We're living with this pluralistic mindset that my truth is, is okay and your truth is okay. No, there is a truth of God and there is a righteousness of God, right standing before God. There is a holiness of God. And that holiness is not what you think is holy or what I think is holy, but it is God who is holy. Which means we are to adhere to every part of what he calls us to, whether it fits our narrative, whether it fits our story, we are to adhere to that. So as we continue through Advent, I encourage and implore all of us to move our lives in line with the holiness and the righteousness of God in serving others, in serving him. If there's a part of your life that you've that you've compromised on and you just said, nah, it's okay, nobody knows and it's not hurting anyone, is it in line with the holiness and righteousness of God? And then he goes on and he says, and you child. And so he, he makes this transition. Remember, he's been talking about Jesus, but this is his son being born. There, there's so much excitement but he knows the focus is God. He knows that this is his story, but then he turns it, shifts it to his son. Listen to what he says about John. And you child will be called the prophet of the most high. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge to the sal of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Think about this. You know that your son, because of the prophecy that's coming out of your mouth, because you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you know that your son is the one to go and prepare the way of the savior of the world. Wow. How huge is that? But here's the secret. Because the Holy Spirit is in you, if you believe in Jesus, you have that high calling as well. You and I are called to prepare the way of the Lord. Because John's responsibility was to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of our sins. Do you know what our responsibility as followers of Jesus is? To give people the knowledge of the need of salvation through Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. It's not Jesus is your buddy. It's not Jesus is your homeboy. It's not Jesus is love. And so we're going to we're going to bring this gushy love into it. No, it is Jesus came to save the world through the forgiveness of our sins. You see, we have forgotten that part of it. We, we grab hold of Jesus came to save the world. Yes, absolutely. And amen. But he came to save the world through the forgiveness of our sins, which only happens through him. Now, we as a church have confused this significantly. We've added all these layers to say, oh, you must do this, must do... No, it is, it is forgiveness of our sins through Jesus. Period. That's it. And that's John's responsibility. And then it goes on. It says, because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high 
to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Y'all, we've got so much darkness in the world and it's not something to be distraught about because the savior of the world has come and Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus came to expose and to explode light into the darkness. Praise be to God for that. But one of the beautiful things is because of his spirit living in us, we are the light of the world through Christ living through us. We are the ones that are that, that should be exposing darkness through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We should be the ones that are bringing light in the darkness. We should be the ones bringing light into the shadows of death. It's a huge calling. It began with John the Baptist to prepare the way for the light of the world coming into the world who is Jesus, Yeshua, our Savior. But now his spirit lives in us. We're the ones to bring the light into the world. Are you adding darkness or are you adding light? That's our calling. What an amazing prophecy from Zechariah. Beginning with praise of God, declaring that Jesus, the Savior of the world, is coming just as God had promised to the ancestors through Abraham, through the promise. And then being brought about and prepared by John the Baptist. And yet we are woven into the tapestry of this entire part of the story because we're called to serve our God without fear and holiness and righteousness. We are called to bring the light of the world through Christ into the places of darkness and the shadow of death. That's our calling. That's our role. That's why you're still here. That's why you're up this morning listening to somebody like me because this is what we're called to. So I pray that not only today, but throughout the rest of Advent and throughout the rest of our life, that we will commit ourselves to this, that we will wake up and realize that this is the calling that God has on us as well. I thank God for you. I pray that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit, not just come over you, but fill you with his Holy Spirit. I pray that you would embrace the Spirit of God and that you and I would walk and serve him in holiness and righteousness and that we would be the light present in the darkness, especially, especially through this Advent season. Until I see you tomorrow, I pray the peace of God, which is spoken to right here, he will guide our our feet into the way of peace. I pray that you will live in peace, knowing that the Savior of the world has come, has redeemed you, has purchased you out of love and tender mercy, so that we will serve him in holiness and righteousness, and that other people will know that they are forgiven of their sins through Jesus Christ. Until I see you tomorrow, God bless you. I love you. Have a great day. I'll see you soon.